Well, hello there. Welcome to another Iceland update here. It is November 14th, Tuesday, about 11.30 here Mountain Standard Time, which would make it about 6.30, I suppose, p.m. Iceland time. Uh, we're still in a wait and see mode, but there are some significant developments I want to mention with my update today. So thanks for joining me. I want to welcome all the new viewers, subscribers. Uh, appreciate all the encouragement. Uh, it seems like we're doing a good job of getting good solid scientific information out without the hype and the hyperbole and some of the speculation you might see otherwise. I also want to thank uh, some of the Icelandic viewers who have reached out to me and provided information about the eruption, some of the things going on on the ground there in Iceland, in particular uh, Amanda Jo Wood who lives in Grindavik and she's provided some really helpful information uh, to me and I'll share that with you today and just help verify some of the stuff I was hearing uh, through the grapevine and, and secondhand. So let's get right to it. Uh, the most significant development uh, in the last 24 hours or so is that uh, sulfur dioxide, a volcanic gas, has been detected in and around Grindavik, uh, elevated level, so above what we typically see as a background level. It's not a high level of sulfur dioxide, um, but it's high enough that uh, it warrants caution. In fact, the the measurement and the detection of that sulfuric gas uh, today, around three o'clock in Iceland, it's about four hours or so ago, um, actually warranted an evacuation. They had some of the residents back in town. They were able to collect some of their things and visit their homes briefly. Uh, but once they detected those sulfur, sulfur dioxide levels, um, that sounded the alarm. I guess the um, the ship, the Coast Guard ship out uh, out in the water near the town actually triggered a whistle or some sort of alarm that let people know that they needed to get out. Not instantaneously, but they needed to quickly grab their things and get out within the next few minutes. And so that's pretty significant. The, um, the detection of sulfur dioxide at the location of the town in Grindavik um, indicates that we now have a pretty clear connection system from the magma to the surface and so what that indicates to me is two things one that the magma is close to the surface what is close definitely within a kilometer which the models had already hinted at before all the data we were getting from uh, the Icelandic Met office was that it was maybe about 800 meters down uh, but again that was based on modeling and indirect data now I would say this is more direct information the detection of that sulfur dioxide at the surface indicates that the magma is quite close to the surface maybe as much as half of a, a kilometer down or so um, and so it's 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 much closer than it would be otherwise and so the, what what that also means is that the the that there's a fracture system a network of fractures that are connecting the ground to that degassing magma body in the subsurface so it's significant it doesn't necessarily mean that an eruption is more likely to occur um, anytime sooner than what we were thinking but it's definitely still trending in the direction of an eruption being uh, pretty likely in in the near future within the next few days so for a lot of you I know it's, it's difficult and it's especially difficult for those there in Iceland and um, con constantly just thinking about them and, and hopefully they understand that a lot of people in the rest of the world are also monitoring the situation and, and wish them the best um, but it's it's a tricky situation because they, they're just gonna have to be patient and persevere um, as this thing inches towards some sort of uh, conclusion whether that's the magma not erupting or whether that's some sort of eruption in some sort of location. So um, the only road in and out of Iceland currently is this road here, road 427. So the road that the direct road that leads to Reykjavik 43 and this one over here to the west 425, those are closed at least coming into uh, Grindavik. This road is only open again with a, an escort in by public officials uh, when it's safe. But as of three o'clock local time in uh, Iceland, they're not allowing anyone in because of the elevated sulfur dioxide levels. So let's let's go back to the update from the Icelandic Met Office. This was as of about 12:40 their time. So that's uh, 
a few hours old but this is the most updated one so uh, earthquakes continuing so they've got earthquakes continuing above and along the orientation of the magma intrusion uh, largest was a 3.1 but the rest were much smaller than that um, and then we'll talk about this here in a second but stress triggered seismicity occurred close to Kliefervatten and so that is a lake over uh, in this area over here. So we've got uh, Grindavik over here in the west. Um, and then there's a lake. I think it's one of the largest. I don't know if that's true. But it's one of the bigger lakes in Iceland uh, called Klifarvatn. There's also a geothermal area here called Klishivik. Um, hopefully I'm getting the pronunciations pretty good there. Um, and so this is another area. But this is another volcanic system, right? You can see this this trending ridge. Um, I've actually done a couple of videos in this area because there's some wonderful um, examples and exposures of subglacial volcanic activity that occurred, you know, thousands of years ago. There's an interesting set of landforms and rock types that you get from that. But this elevated region here is a, a lot of this is eruptions that took place when this was covered with ice uh, in the last few thousands or tens of thousands of years. But this is another volcanic system, and we went over uh, these in my last update. And I'll talk a little bit about those here in a second. Uh, going back to the update. Um, yeah, so earthquakes in that area. Largest was a 3.8. And today most earthquakes are occurring along the magma intrusion, mostly being micro earthquakes, meaning they're quite small, not detected, uh, probably in the, the zero to like two range in terms of magnitude and with depths of about three to five kilometers. Um, and let's see what else they got here. The everything else is pointing towards, you know, the magma is still there. Uh, it's it's not maybe intruding as quickly, so the inflow uh, of magma into the intrusion is a little bit slower than what it, than what it was at the beginning of last weekend. Between the 12th and 13th of November, the inflow, meaning how much magma is moving into the system, is about 75 cubic meters per second. And I was on a, a Facebook group and someone did a nice job of turning that into a volume or a rate that most people could digest and understand. And so that's essentially the same amount. So if you think of like an Olympic sized swimming pool, um, at that rate, it would take it about 33 seconds to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool. So another way to think of it is it can fill in one minute, that rate of flow could fill two Olympic sized swimming pools. So it's a very large and significant amount of magma that we're looking at. Again, you know, they're thinking it's about 800 meters down. I think though with the sulfur dioxide emissions that are happening, I think you could probably cut this in half, maybe even it's shallower than that, but it's it's quite close to the surface in order for those gases uh, to be making their way to the surface. And because the gases have a clear line to the surface, that means if and when the magma is at the point of eruption, once it has that buoyancy and that pressure, and now it's got a conduit. Um, and they actually found that, according to Amanda, who lives in Grindavik, one of the sulfur dioxide measurement points was right by her house in Grindavik. And so that's 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 unfortunate, but that's um, that's pretty alarming that they're actually finding a direct connection to the subsurface magma body right there in town. Doesn't mean that that's going to be the place that it erupts per se, um, but still it, it's something worth noting. Um, and I think that's about it. They've installed more uh, SO2 detectors in a few different places. And so that'll help as we move forward with forecasting the eruption location and figuring out where things might be going on is by having more of those SO2 detectors in place. Unfortunately, I think the way those work, and don't quote me on this, um, they have to work when during daylight hours when the sun is out because the way they look at gas coming out of the ground. The SO2 gas is largely uh, invisible, although you definitely could smell it, so it, it does have an odor. Um, but the only way to detect the actually, to actually measure the concentrations uh, has to be done during the day with, with enough ambient light. And so that's tricky because this time of year in Iceland, of course, it's quite dark for a good portion of the day and the weather's often cloudy. And so uh, there might be portions of the the day or even days where they're not able to take good measurements of the SO2 that's coming out of the ground. Um, okay, so let's go back to, let's go to, uh, well, we can look at this um, other 
image right here I actually blew this up a little bit and so, uh, this was on the update yesterday i just somehow forgot that it was at the bottom of the page and, and neglected it so i apologize but this is um a, a ground deformation image so this shows from the 10th to 11th of november uh, how much the ground was moving uh, vertically or downward and so basically the oranges and reds here are uplifted areas and then as you look into the greens and purples and I guess blues there that would be a down drop area and the best way this is my um, take on this or, or one interpretation of this data uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here so I'm open to any ideas that folks might have but I wonder if the because we remember we were seeing uplift in the region going back into late last week uh, around the power plant in the Blue Lagoon. Then we saw that move over to the east under the road and over to the uh, the crater row there, Sundu Nukur, um, the old crater row that exists there. And now I'm wondering because the magma intrusion has come up and lengthened itself. So it's uh, you know a certain amount of magma, but because it's, it's lengthened considerably, and you know we've seen that on uh, the models that they have where this we have this 15 kilometer um, intrusion of magma I my thought is perhaps because it's lengthened so much that it's not occupying as much of the the volumes not occupying as much of that that distance and so it, it subsided a little bit and so we're seeing uh, even cracks in the ground in some what we call subsidence. The ground is sinking a little bit in and around uh, Grindavik. And so, again, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's you take it with a grain of salt. That's just one possible interpretation of that data there. So we'll have to see. Um, and yeah, so then there's also the a news, one of the news wires here that we already went over this though, that basically this was the evacuation today um, because of the sulfur dioxide. And so, um, yeah, just letting you know that there's there are a few news reports that jive with that. Uh, if we look at the, the seismic data, I had a couple things I wanted to show here. So this is the last 24 hours. I've got it selected to magnitude 1 and above. If we go to maybe the last 12 hours or so, um, not much of a decrease. But, you know, this we've talked about. This is obviously related to the magma intrusion. So this, this strong southwest-northeast trend. Uh, right near uh, and through Gudindavik. Um, but I had a few people wondering what was going on to the east and maybe there's some questions about what's going on to the west here. And so we have had earthquakes. I think if we go back to 24 hours or so, there was at least one larger quake over here, a 3.8 uh, near this lake, Klifervatten, and the geothermal area down here. And so we are seeing some earthquakes Again, not nearly to the level we saw around Grindavik um, last week and into the weekend, but there have been some earthquakes here. And again, I haven't seen any uh, interpretation on those. I don't think that those are necessarily magma intruding from this area over to this area. So I don't think those at all mean that they're signs of another volcanic eruption. Oftentimes what happens when you get a lot of earthquakes in another area is you can trigger earthquakes in nearby areas and so you've got these fractures these older volcanic rocks over here in this area and over here offshore um, off the coast here and perhaps the the intrusion of magma that stress actually dissipates into the surrounding rocks and so that change in stress and the shaking caused by these earthquakes we've had over the last weekend or so has actually triggered some seismicity in these areas. So what I guess what I'm saying is, is I think these are probably uh, seismic events that are responding to this intrusion of magma, the main event that's going on in this location. And so um, I wouldn't worry too much about these being, you know, we're not going to get these three locations erupting simultaneously. Um, and there's no indication that magma is intruding either of these two areas uh, to the west and to the east of this central area that we've been focused on here so far. So I hope that makes a, a little bit of sense. Um, I did also want to point out um, there's another fun thing you can get off this website that uh, you might find interesting, just more of an academic exercise, not really pertinent to um, you know the, 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 the human component of this 
impending situation but on the bigger earthquakes in here when you click on them notice they give you uh, there's this fun little things that are informally called beach balls these are actually more uh, formally in geology parlance called focal mechanism solutions and without getting to the nitty-gritty basically by looking at the seismic data from one specific earthquake we can tell whether the fault that produced the earthquake moved by extension meaning that the rocks were stretched apart by compression meaning that the rocks were shoved up and over each other or by lateral horizontal movements what we call strike slip movements and so once you kind of wrap your head around these things they're actually pretty easy to identify if it's got a white area in the center uh, it looks like a kind of like an I guess like a, a eyeball or something in a weird way um, these are indicative of extension and then these lines that cross here um, I can't show it while I move the cursor off it, but these lines that cross around this central area are showing you which way the fault uh, is oriented. So in this case, it's oriented northeast, southwest, which we probably would have guessed anyway because we're seeing all that in the seismic uh, data. Oops, sorry. Um, but then the other thing it's showing us is, here we go, um, that this is a normal fault, that the, this is an extensional fault. The rocks are being pulled apart in a northwest, southeast direction. And so you can see these for some of them. If you see ones that look like, let's see if we can find one that's different. Uh, there's a good one. When they cross and make more of an X shape like that, that's indicative of horizontal or strike slip motion. So probably what's happening here is um, this is the fault plane or the fault here this line one of these two has to be the fault plane in this case because of the orientation of the the fissure system and, and the tectonics of Iceland this makes the most sense um, and in this case these rocks on this side oh boy now I gotta find that one again um, ah. uh, anyway hopefully you can remember what that one looked like uh, maybe I can find it again in there I thought it was this big one um, come on it only shows them for the larger quakes. Oh, let's do this. This will be good. I should have thought about this before. Okay, so now we've got rid of some of the smaller ones. Yeah, there's that one again. Um, so this means that the, the rocks on the west side of the fault moved down to the southwest and the rock relative to the rocks on the right side of the fault, which moved... Uh, to the up to the northeast so this is a what we call a left lateral strike slip fault so when the rocks moved just a little bit and this was a small quake this was a two point something uh so probably only moved you know a few millimeters maybe a few centimeters something like that but it shows that it was uh, sideways motion versus some of these other ones which were uh up and down motion and and extension related opening up and that's why you might look at some of these around good where they're actually getting you know cracks in the ground opening that's because the fault movement there uh, is like that if you see ones like this where they're not a perfect x and something kind of in between the two we've looked at these are actually oblique so they're moving up and down a little bit but they're also moving side to side so it has two components of motion there so if you're interested in that again these are called focal mechanism solutions uh, they're also sometimes called beach balls informally and you might be able to look a few things up about that so i thought that might be a little bit uh, interesting. I do have a couple photos to share as well that I've just picked up from uh, the interwebs of some of the damage that's been done in the area and in Grindavik and some of the homes and buildings there. So you can see uh, this is just, again probably from shaking of the home and depending on your construction styles in your home this is pretty common is for these door frames and window frame corners. These are likely places for rupture to occur and get cracks in the walls uh, you can see the up in the movement and you can see this up and down displacement here around this building um, with the the bricks there uh, this is one that's made a lot of rounds on the internet because it looks a little bit more foreboding because of the steam but at this point this was just steam so remember that it's quite cold in Iceland right now the air temperature is very cool uh, and and we have subsurface water pipes um, coming out and so that's just if this was 
and you know a nice warm day in the summertime in the middle of the afternoon uh, you probably wouldn't even see the steam there so it looks a little bit more foreboding than it really is but you can still see uh, the, the d extensive damage to the road so even if we don't have uh, any sort of eruption taking place anytime soon and if this all if this whole thing just subsides and goes away very quickly which would be great there would still be a considerable amount of work that would need to be done to get the infrastructure repairs done in Glindavik and get it back up and running uh, and this is I think that same I believe that's the same place just an aerial view yeah I think that's the same place along this this roadway here so hopefully uh, those are somewhat helpful to you. Um, okay, so let's see. So a couple headlines that came up on this website that I thought we could maybe go over here. And so basically they're reporting unchanged situation, still a significant chance of an eruption. Uh, the government did pass a bill to allow construction of defense structures near uh, different pieces of infrastructure on the peninsula so i don't know the exact details of that obviously the power plant would be one item for sure um, i don't know if it's just applying to government and federal property if it applies to homes uh, maybe someone can get back with me on details on that um, yeah and then this this one specifically about the the power plant walls here uh, authorization to start construction of defense walls um, and they're starting to move material there seismic activity is high but weaker we've talked about that uh, some of this is the Icelandic English translation but they're calling it a sinkhole it's probably just a, a fissure a crack um, not I think of when I think of a sinkhole I think of something somewhat rounded uh, I don't know the details on that but up to a meter deep there's some area of collapse and subsidence that's probably the safer way to put it um, yeah, and residents, they've been able to collect uh, a lot of their stuff. The animals are safe from what I'm hearing, and so that's good news. So um, we've kind of done as much as we can right now, and really it's, again, the waiting game and just trying to wait and see how this whole thing plays out. Uh, all the, the scenarios that I ran through before, I believe, are still pretty much on the table um, in terms of possibly a submarine or undersea eruption which would be locally explosive it would produce some ash but i don't think it would be uh, a big event like we saw in 2010 with iaf at um, and we're more likely to see some sort of eruptive event possibly right here in town or maybe further up the intrusive intrusive body up to the northeast in this area here we still have some risk for sure for the blue lagoon and the power plant uh, if we had that eruption further upslope that would definitely still be a risk even if we had a localized eruption here there could be you know minor amounts of ash especially if it was submarine eruption that impacted the blue lagoon and the power plant but those would be uh, very secondary to actually having a lava flow uh, inundate that area um, uh, a couple other things just just to to mop up and finish up this this update then and i hope this has been helpful to you and again i appreciate the time you spent tuning into these and getting updated some of you are in iceland and this is important to you others of you are like me are are, are interested a lot of you have expressed concern because you've spent time in iceland or you have friends or family there and so you like me you have a a, a connection a vested interest in, in what's happening and i think that's great and um best we can do is just let the good piece, people of iceland know that we're we're thinking about them and that uh, this ongoing situation is very much uh, in the back of our minds or in our the front of our minds i suppose um one thing i did not do well on my last overview where i, where I talked about iceland and its sort of big geologic big picture geologic setting is I mentioned it's a divergent plate boundary where the plates are spreading but it's also a hot spot it's a really unique location because it's two different tectonic settings in one location it is the boundary between the Eurasian and the North American plate where the plates are spreading but it's also a plate where place where uh, it has an anomalously high amount of magma that rises up at this divergent plate boundary and so much so that it's erupted so much material that it's built up an island as we look at most divergent plate boundaries like the one here 
that cuts through the Atlantic Ocean. Um, these erupt lava as well, but they're not that active. Um, they don't erupt enough lava to pile up on the seafloor and make much uh, of a landmass. There are a few exceptions to that, but for the most part, you just don't see divergent boundaries pop up out of the ocean. But in Iceland, we've had so much volcanic activity over the last 20, 25 million years that it's built up a sizable landmass um, above the ocean. And again, that's because it's not just a divergent boundary, but it's also a hotspot. So I wanted to make sure I, I threw that in there. A couple other um, questions that have come up that I can maybe quickly address, and then we'll, we'll call this good for today. Um, there's been questions about connections between this volcano and other global volcanoes. Like there's some things going on in Italy with Etna and Campi Flegre and Mount St. Helens a few weeks ago had a few earthquakes um, above background levels. Um, those are unrelated. They're totally different systems. Uh, the magma that feeds one volcano is not connected to another volcano that's, you know, especially when it's thousands of miles away. And so there's not a subterranean plumbing system in the earth that connects global volcanoes, if that makes sense. And so whatever happens in Iceland, it is completely unrelated to what might be happening in Italy, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, in Indonesia, in New Zealand. They're all completely different systems. And sure enough, if you really tracked volcanoes globally, um, there's volcanoes having some level of activity uh, every single day, whether it's just minor eruptions of ash or lava or outgassing of uh, different gases, um, earthquakes, deformation, all of that's happening every single day. Uh, it's usually just becomes a bigger deal when it's uh, ex significant and explosive or like the case here in Iceland where we're seeing um, an impact on people and humanity. If we took the exact same episode that's taken place over the last week and a half uh, near Glindavik, if we took it and just plunked it down in the middle of Iceland, um, most of us would never even know it's, it was going on. The Icelandic Met Office would know. They would issue their scientific reports, but we wouldn't have an evacuation. No one would be at risk. And so remember, these are just natural earth processes, but they only truly become hazards or even catastrophes sometimes if humans are kind of caught up in the midst of it, right? Um, if we're not, if there's not a threat to property or human lives, then it's just an event. It's just something that scientists pay attention to and not most of the general public. So that might be some perspective that's that's helpful. Um, and, you know, so still, even though this is a very isolated event in this little area, let's, let's also not diminish uh, how big of an event this is in Iceland, that this is a pretty big deal. This is a significant, even though it's a small town compared to a lot of other places, this is actually a fairly large urban area when you look at Iceland as a country. And so I just want to be sensitive to that. So uh, with that, um, I think that's about it. Uh, one idea I had, I just wanted to throw at you guys and see what you thought is, and I don't know if this would work well or if it would blow up and, and not be um, productive, but rather than these updates being one way videos that I just post and then there they are, uh, we could try doing one of those this week as a live stream where you guys are able to answer, chat amongst each other, but also uh, ask questions that I could then address. And so I'm open to doing that maybe as early as tomorrow, which would be Wednesday the 15th, um, but maybe on the 16th, which would be Thursday. Kind of depends on what happens with the situation. Obviously, if things were start to start to, if it was to start erupting, um, that might change things a little bit. But let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in. If you're not familiar with the YouTube live stream, it's basically um, getting onto YouTube at a specific time of day um, on a specific date. And then I might be presenting my update, but then simultaneously there's a, a text chat going where viewers can uh, communicate with each other. And then they can also ask me questions and then I can answer those questions more or less um, 
live right rather than you getting the the reply much later i have tried to reply to most of if not all the comments that have come through on the last few updates realize that there's a lot of them um, but I, I do try to go through those and answer those as best I can. Uh, if I've somehow missed yours or ignored those, uh, I probably did read it. Sometimes it's something that I don't have the time to dive into. Like, for example, people who want to know what's happening with some of the volcanoes in Italy. I haven't really been paying much attention to those, not because I'm not interested, just uh, I've only got so much bandwidth just like you. And so uh, if I'm not answering, I'm still probably reading it. Um, I just might not have a comment on it if I don't have much to contribute to it. So, and then the last thing real quick is I may um, repost. I, I did several videos in Iceland when I visited in 2022, including some of the eruptive footage. And I might repost some of those with some comments and things just so some folks can see what an Iceland eruption looks like on land what we typically see in this part of Iceland um, with these volcanoes here um, that erupted in 2022. So I may repost that with a little bit of uh, commentary in it just so you can see that. I want to make sure though that when I post that I need to be careful because I don't want people to see that and think that I'm showing what's happening now. And so I'll probably have to think about that a little bit. Maybe let me know if you think that's a good idea and helpful or maybe if that just adds to the confusion, then I just don't even want to deal with it. I'll just stay away from that. But um, I just thought it would be helpful for some people to see uh, footage and sort of my take as I was standing right in front of that er eruption uh, in 2022 and some of the commentary I have there. So uh, thank you all for your support. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for paying attention to this situation in Iceland. Thank you for all the well wishes you give our good friends in Iceland. Um, at this point, it's it's a tough situation because they've got to kind of deal with it on their own. There's not a lot we can do remotely to assist them, um, but it seems like they've done a great job of monitoring, getting people out of harm's way, and now it's just a wait and see experience, which I know is really tricky. Every day you're away from your home and you're not sure uh, it's just, it's difficult and it's just, you're probably not sleeping well. Your, your life is completely disrupted. And so I, I do empathize with you and we'll just hope for the best. Um, but at the same time, we'll be expecting possibly some of the worst scenarios that could transpire. So uh, with that, thank you so much for joining me and uh, we'll catch you on the next update in Iceland.